Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to be here today. Um, I was just in the back, uh, just chatting away with my friend, and all of a sudden, this lady opened the door and said, go. I said, okay, well, it's my turn. Um, this is, I believe, uh, it has been a long day today for you, and uh, uh, this will be the last one, I believe, after you have uh, refreshment and a uh, uh, nice evening. So bear with me for another 30 minutes. Um, my name is Paul Tange. I'm uh, president of Tange Associates. And today, um, I would like to talk about uh, creating a livable high-density city. Uh, this title was given to me. It wasn't my title. I just found out Mike Owen is the one who just gave this title for my speech. So I had to create my speech along this line. Um, but anyway, I'll carry on. Well, Tange Associates uh, was founded by my father, Kenzo Tange, uh, almost 70 years ago. And uh, we've been quite fortunate that we have been in working in a different, con different country, 32 countries, more than 480 projects, and so on. And luck oh, luckily, uh, we are working in a global uh, way. But lately, uh, we are really concentrating on our work in Asia. Asia is a very, uh, as everybody knows, in the financial world, economic uh, uh, situation, and uh, architectural world, we all know Asia is a very exciting place today. And of course, Asian cities, I mean, one of the characteristics is high density. And, you know, maybe non-Asians, I guess, you know, many of the cities, Taipei, Shanghai, Seoul, uh, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Beijing, Hong Kong, Jakarta, Tokyo, all the same. And what's just, there's one thing in common, which is a high density. But uh, every city has an incredibly rich uh, history and tradition and culture. So that I think we have to really uh, see how each city's character will be kind of highlighted while we are looking at urban, uh, urban design or architectural design. And then again, talking about high density, it's been like historically, until I would even say the 1970s, many of the high rides were single usage. Hotel, residential, office, all single tower with a single usage. And very quickly in the 80s and 90s, things started to moving faster to a multi-usage. Um, one of our building here, a Park Tower in Shinjuku, this was the first vertical mixed-use development in Japan. I think Hiro Mori may correct me later. But anyway, I believe that's the first one. It's a hotel, office, and a retail a vertical development. And then from that 90s to today, all of a sudden, if there's some more expansion, it's, for example, our Fuji Television headquarter building in Odaiba. It's one office tower and one studio tower, and then every, everything is connected by the bridge. And another project that we have done in Beijing, office building and a, a hotel. Hotel is newly built. We've changed the facade of the office, and we put all the public facility on top of the street. And then we are talking about this gateway in Singapore again, you know, mixed-use development in you know, a horizontal connectivity with the infrastructure and so on. So I think uh, our uh, answer to these solutions are you know, vast. And then we are just going to go through a couple of examples using those, uh, some of my uh, built work. But Tange Associate has a you know, very simple I idea to design the building. Of course, function is important. When, when, which era that we are building today and how it's going to be looked at in future is very important. And local flavor, definitely very important to make a character to the building. And historical, traditional background, all the city, location, even single site has that. And of course, different city has a different scale. So I think we have to think all of that as a context and then uh, inject that into each project. 
So when we design the building, the building, even in Tokyo, cannot be brought to uh, Taipei nor Shanghai because each character of the city is quite different. And well, today I will I'll pick just three of our projects to just go through uh, with you uh, my experience with high-density cities. First, I will go with a, a project in Tokyo in Shinjuku, 50-story school building, Tokyo Modo Gakuen uh, Kokun Tower. It was a, a very challenging project because uh, we have 10,000 students coming in every, every day to this building, about 200 meter tall, 50-story uh, school building. In a high-density development, of course, you know, lands are scarce, but you know, we have to create a new school, so I think you know, we, have to have, uh, we have to go vertical. I mean, let me tell you about, a little bit about the background of Shinjuku itself. Shinjuku Station is one of the busiest train stations in the world. I don't know how many people are coming in, but there's a huge amount of people. And This blue area that you see is the Shin Shinjuku Central Business District. It used to be a water reservoir of Tokyo, and then they moved out about 30 years ago, and that was the only time that Japan, Tokyo had a super block, and nine super block was there. So this was the first time that you know, uh, Tokyo had a concentration of high-rise building. And what our idea was when we uh, looked at this project, Shinjuku Station connecting to the uh, Central Business District. Beyond that is Shinjuku Central Park. And in between, we have a mixed zone. Mixed zone sounds better than the actual reality. Reality is a mix, mishmash of small building for the for restaurants and so on. So what we're trying to do, even if you come out of the Shinjuku Station, if you look for, uh, front, you cannot see the uh, high-rise building clearly. So what we thought was, this red zone has to be revitalized, and how do we do that? By creating a new building, which is totally different from office building, and make a kind of a statement there so that that would kind of uh, bring in the new development in that red zone, mixed use zone. And when we are designing this building, I mean vertical building, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult because, I mean, if, if you're a square building, you just don't have enough ground on the, uh, to, to, for the open space, and then the top will be, uh, you're cutting out skies. So what we thought about is this is a school. It's for the student. We named it Kokun Tower. Kokun is, you know, we cherish the student and educate them, and then once they are ready, we take them out to the real world. And so this is the reason that we designed this building in this shape, it's like a cocoon shape, but that was not just my egoistic approach to this solution, but what I tried to do is, even for the small site, we try to reduce the size of the bottom part so that we can open up the space in the bottom as a green space, and everybody talk about the environment as only green space on the ground, I mean, Mori Group is very well known for creating a beautiful green spaces by bringing a high-rise building. But we thought that you know, we bring the, bottom, the top part and part small. And that means that you have more sky. Sky is also a very important part of the environment. So by doing that, we started having this cocoon shape. So what, what we tried to do was not only the images, but we tried to bring back to the city itself. And there's another uh, in difficult thing that we had to do, which was to fit three vocational school. I mean, this is not a, a, a university, it's a vocational school, so that there are uh, many students, maths will come, and the fashion, IT, and medical uh, schools are there in three bits. But what we tried to create is that the shared zone in between. Because this shared zone is 
maybe a, a teacher's lounge. It could be uh, some spaces that they can share in classrooms and so on. And if fashion school gets bigger one year, then it comes down a little bit more than a, a, a one third, and then so on. So that it's kind of, a, you can make the program shift as the needs comes. And while I was doing this, I really started thinking, but it's easy to say everything we put in a vertical form in school uh, function, but I start realizing that, you know, but we really have to redefine the school architecture when we go vertical. What is campus? You know, you went to schools, universities, and so on. There are places that you think of in the, in, the, in the back of your mind, oh, that was my school. So I think we have to give that kind of experience. So we have to create a gathering place for school, as for student. What is a typical school? It's usually horizontal development with a center is a schoolyard. That's where you communicate you, uh, with your friends, and with professors, you enjoy yourself there, et cetera, and do the sports and so on. But of course, if you go vertical, you cannot have that kind of space. So how can we try to create that kind of space? What we have done is, of course, classroom is very important. So we will have this pink rectilinear classrooms that can be subdivided or taken away. So this is actually some of the rooms. Some of them are double volume. Some of them are one room, uh, one large room. But some of them you can subdivide with three. Typical classroom. Um, even though the building shape it misleads you that you have a funny looking classroom. No, we have a very straightforward classroom. And in between, we have student salon, which is where, which I think is a one answer to uh, uh, the, the new type of gathering space, schoolyard, a school uh, yard, which is like a truncated version of one big schoolyard and on top of each other. So you can see in the, bil in the building, this is what I call student uh, salon. And luckily, students react to it, and then they gather during the break. They have lunch uh, and so on. And also these activities, every three floors, in three, part three sides of the building, you can see from the street also. So that it's, uh, it's a, uh, oh, what is happening over there? It's a, it's a funny looking building. Well, actually, my, 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 uh, my company people do not want me to call this funny looking building. Um, sorry, unique looking building. <laughs> and, but you know, if you go to uh, Shinjuku, uh, take a taxi and then say, go to a funny looking building. <laughs> they get there. So that's pretty good. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, it's iconic. Uh, anyway, so these three-story uh, uh, atrium-like space, a student salon, can be seen from outside so that they can really understand that, oh, this is a school, let's go there, instead of having a just a box-like typical uh, building. And to my surprise, and this is like what we felt that is, uh, we were awarded because this space by students' wish, started to have its own fashion show or lecture or some kind of ceremony. So our idea was kind of have a smaller gathering space, truncated on top of each other and so on. But actually, they themselves really activated this space to uh, better use. And now, let me take you to Singapore. Well, this is actually a rather interesting project in Orchard Road. It's a multi-function uh, uh, building that we have just completed. It's Orchard Gateway. Maybe some people, some of you are familiar with uh, Orchard Road. Uh, it is, uh, in Japan, it's a similar street will be maybe Omote Sando or Ginza, a shopping street and so on. It is a major uh, shopping street in Singapore.
And Orchard Road is somewhere around two kilometers long. And if you have been there, it's, I mean, climate is in one way wonderful, warm, but sometimes it's very difficult for you to keep on walking. So Orchard Road made by itself a certain node in a stretch of two kilometers. And luckily, those are roughly 500 meters. I think in 500 meters is some, just a bulk number that you can really walk in one stretch. If it's hot, maybe a little bit less, but I mean, that's a good time, a good distance for you, for you to travel and then rest and then so on. And then Singapore have had a little bit of a, uh, those space in each 500 meter space and comes our new project. So it was like located in a very nice way. And also, Ocho Road was seen as a very linear development. If you have walked the uh, Ocho Road, it's like one shopping mall to after the other. And it's very linear development. But luckily, our site is Ocho Road, but there's a historical conservation street, which is Paranakan, uh, historical, like uh, the traditional buildings and so on. So what I, and then also old site that you see in this yellow color, used to have a hotel and a small shopping uh, element with a very tiny alleyway or arcade in the center. And I am Japanese, but I've been to Singapore since I was 12 years old and my father used to go to work and my mother and I had nothing to do, so we go shopping. And that was like a little alleyway that it was one and only on Orchard Road that go from one side to Somerset Road. And if you talk to many people in Singapore, they say, oh yeah, that arcade. So what we try to do is try to bring back that feeling in a much grander way. So what we have done is we connected that historical passage. And uh, our site is very small on Ocho Road, but we have created larger space on the back, and there is another discovery walk that we have created as a shopping experience with two other shopping malls, and they connect to the uh, next road, which means that instead of linear development, what we have, to, we, what we have managed to do plan-wise is spread into the plane. And as function-wise, we have two, uh, one shopping road and then the historical building and the subway station. And we have a hotel on top of the building and the retails. And this side is office and retail. This was a, a competition scheme. We were asked to design this side only. But when I saw this plan, I see that similar, uh, same bank group happened to own this site in an underdeveloped three-story building. So what I thought was like, let me connect these two towers and then even bring the bridge so that people can go across. And in this way, it's not only the mixed-use development, but you know, you horizontally connect it. I mean, Singapore is unlike Hong Kong, where second level, everything is connected in a central area so that people can walk on the ground level, above level, and under, underground. Uh, street of Orchard Road was not very friendly street. So what we thought was having a visual connectivity is quite important there. And of course, each elements are there, but instead of putting everything together, we try to create some uh, breathing space like sky gardens and so on, sky lounge and so on. Another aspect is just because I stretched to both sides, I could create a gateway. Uh, this uh, uh, name, came afterwards, but what we wanted to do is this arch-shaped two towers, different in height, but it is right in the center of Ocha Road, 
and Orchard Road do not have any correspondence from one side to the other before. But what we wanted to do is highlight that aspect by creating, since we had the opportunity to design both sides of the street, create some kind of a gateway, sense of arrival. And uh, below that, that sense of arrival comes with small plaza. Compared to other plazas, this plaza is not that big. But it plays a very important role because it is not a complete circle, but by reacting to the situation, one tower here, another tower there, with a, a respond to a, a similar circular element, you start seeing togetherness of bridging across one side of the street to the other. So I think this is like, a, a, again, a hybrid space where you can, uh, you can create sense of belonging. So in this whole of the complex, I mean, it's a function of office, retail, uh, library, hotel, uh, uh, the shopping experience, and so on. But I think what it is that in between those, where I circle in uh, oval shape, like upper sky lounge over here with a swimming pool, and then uh, another uh, barrier, uh, you know, kind of a nice gathering space between hotel and the retail, and discovery walk, covered walk, uh, the shopping experience, instead of walking only on the main street. And then this is a shopping experience as well. So they have one street, two street, three street of shopping. And then bridge itself and then plaza together also becomes a very important uh, uh, hybrid space where people can share. So, I mean, even, even the mixed-use development in, in general, I mean, you know, we, we have the gone vertical, horizontal, and all these things. What I think is important is this hybrid space that really highlight uh, uh, people together in a different scale, and then so that, you know, activity will be kind of uh, 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 created more. The third example that I talk about is in Hong Kong. And this is a very uh, interesting project for me because I have uh, done that 44 hectares uh, master plan work for uh, cultural district, art and cultural district of uh, Kowloon. And actually, I propose a few designs there. Then I start realizing that Hong Kong, or any, I mean, looking at Hong Kong, Hong Kong is starting to lose its own identity, I felt. Then again, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Tokyo, all these cities are now so glo global that we start to lose our own identity. But I think globalization is really not the uh, end to our growth. I mean, gro globalization is a way that we, for us to understand local flavor. So when I was looking at this, uh, some project in Hong Kong, I started realizing, ooh, you know, Hong Kong, what is, the, what is the essence of Hong Kong? Essence of Hong Kong is really a street energy. And this land, supposed to, it's actually facing a Nathan Road. Nathan Road is one of tourist attractions. You see a neon sign, you know, people screaming and shouting. I mean, you, you can even smell chashu pao and all these things. And everybody say, wow, you know, this is an energy home. Not necessarily it's most beautiful, but, but that's the energy. And nowadays you see one block of Nathan Road developed, looks like Singapore, and then another one developed, looks like Kuala Lumpur, and then you put everything together, sense of Hong Kong will be gone. So I said, well, this is something that we have to achieve. I mean, whether this is a pretty picture or not, but this is Hong Kong. Colorful, I mean, you don't know, nothing matches, neon sign, wow. And then if you walk the street, 
It's retail, retail, dining, dining, retail, retail, dining. I don't know, what the, whatever. I mean, this is too systematic. It's like a mixture of everything, right? And then if everybody take away the new beautiful building there, there, what, what's going to be Nathan Road? It's the same thing as Orchard Road. It could be Central. Uh, I mean, the, all, this, all this energy is going to be gone. So I said, well, let's keep it. I can create vertical shopping experience like street. When I said the 24-story uh, above ground, four, five-story below ground shopping mall, uh, I designed, everybody said, you must be mad. And I think I am mad. But I look at it in a totally different way. It's five stories of various type of experience connected by vertical street and so that it's a walking down a five-story shopping mall one after the other. And they, you can control the environment, then it gives a sense of energy, not like neon sign and all these things, but you know, that's, a, that's the energy of Hong Kong. So, I just, even the facade, I put various types of energy. It doesn't, if, if I do that for, for Mori building, I think he will fire me. <laughs> but in Hong Kong, I think it's okay. Because I think to me, I, I really believe that this is, this is the street life of Hong Kong. So, I mean, top level is like a top, uh, you know, terrace restaurants. And then we have a middle level, you know, a regular uh, takeout restaurant and so on. And then we have uh, high, uh, shopping experience of five stories in two different locations and the cineplex. And I really show that in the facade. And by creating various type of vertical uh, uh, open spaces and the elevator escalator together, you can really go through the building as if you're going to the city. And with, between those spaces, there's a, uh, the, between all these fun, different functions, instead of just stacking everything together, we created Sky Lounge, Vertical Street, Event Space. So instead of having one uniform, uniform plan of center corridor, shop, 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 and then another story, everybody gets very confused because you don't know which floor you're in, and then nobody's gonna go all the way to 24th floor. But by creating that, something like this, and it's a changing of mindset, this 25-story shopping mall doesn't look so bad. So recapture some of the ideas. You know, high density, of course, we have to go vertical. But you know, if you change your mindset, I think you, know, you can do many different things. And it's not so horrible to go vertical. Quickly, I will, I will go through with uh, ref referring back to uh, Japanese cultural, uh, 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 Japanese culture. I mean, this is what we are, when we are talking about hybrid space, but in Asia, we have this kind of space because my daughter nowadays, I mean, gosh, just young kids. Multitasking, they call it, but they are doing uh, homeworks uh, online with somebody on a phone, uh, watching a, a t TV show, an iPad on on the bed. So I mean, it's like, well, this is crazy. I thought, but now if you think about it, how many people are listening to my speech now? Somebody's texting, so, oh, thank you. <laughs> somebody's texting, somebody's doing this, somebody's doing that. But not that they're not, not listening to me. But everybody is doing everything together. So, I mean, that's the way our life is. So I think space has to change. And this is the reason that I think Asian time is coming up. Because in Asia, that is in our culture. Because in Western culture, here's a wall inside and outside, very clear. But in Japan or in Asia, that's not the way it works. Look at this beautiful space in Katsura. You know, it's 
inside, shows you screen, tsukimidai, that you can go there and then be romantically alone or with somebody to look at the moon. And all these layers of sliding doors. I mean, you don't know. Uh, it's, it's all fuzzy space, you know, it's all hybrid space. Using that in a different architecture, it will create a very interesting place. This was a, a proposal that I did for one of our clients in Singapore. He had a very small site, and these buildings are surrounding, but he wanted to have some interesting development. So we have created this uh, a residential hotel service apartment project. Here is a parking structure. It's a bamboo garden, I call it. The structurally, it's not a straight, uh, uh, but you know, it, it's hold the building. This is hotel, hotel, service apartment, residential, and then in, in between, there's a sky garden of different sizes. And then if you go high up there, you have a wonderful view of Orchard Road. So I mean, this is like an idea of combining uh, function that we have to fulfill as an architect. Clients always tell me to design something. Residential, hotel, mixed use, whatever it is. But then we have to add some value by creating this fuzzy space. Again, in office development that we are just uh, starting to uh, doing the working drawings. It's an office building. He wanted to go to a certain height, so we have to stretch the building. So we have an open uh, special uh, floors here. There are all the meeting rooms where with a, almost like a house in, in the sky. And on top of that, we are creating the green corner in each part of the building, each floor, of the, every three floor of the building. But this green corner is actually outside, but it's inside. What it is, is we have gla glass outside, and then people can gather around, but it's open joint. And of course, in a, uh, maybe you, uh, plainly if I say, uh, certain new air has to come in. That means some of the old air has to go out. So it's cool. So instead of just blowing out everywhere, you just blow into that space. So it's aut automatically cooler space. But it is outside. So you can like, it's kind of, it's glass in. So you know, if it's raining, it's not so bad. But still, you can get the free, free flow of the air. So I think these are the kind of spaces that you know, we are trying to create, add value to the client. But at the same time, it's a, it's a very, uh, interesting space. It's a hybrid space. In Sentosa Cove, we have uh, designed a, uh, this is a Sentosa Cove is a, a residential, resorty residential area in Singapore. Again, we try to create the building. It's quite a gentle curve, so it does not affect the floor plan, but actually building is kind of moving through the space because it's a, a, a island uh, setting. And we have a double skin space. Instead of having just a plain balcony, what we try to create is a, 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 like a thickness of the facade, and then we can create green greenhouse or a balcony or special rooms and so on. And then all these buildings can be connected above so that that becomes a, a public space for a community to use. In Beijing, we have created the buildings with the idea of office building with the skin, so that that uh, fuzzy middle part becomes uh, very much of a, a creative office space. And then, actually, this was actually a smaller building complex that we have just f finished building. Again, we are creating the green terraces and wrap around with, oops, sorry. Wrap around with this lacy kind of uh, material, and then that will be lit at night. So it gives a kind of a softer edge to the rather harsh uh, office building. And then Yongsan International Building District 
project. It's a 30-story uh, mixed-use uh, vertical development of the schools, restaurants, and uh, retail experience, and so on. It was like expanded version of what I showed you early, uh, the one before. This skin is not only that, that the you know, fuzzy green spaces, but it's also uh, actually the billboard so that everybody can kind of project the information out. So I mean, wrapping up my idea of hybrid space, of course, all these different hybrid space, of course, we always think of functions, you know, I mean, time and historical background and local flavors and scales and all these things as a context. But you know, that is not enough anymore. I mean, all these Asian cities are very uh, high dense uh, places, so we need a breathing space. Otherwise, you're just one space to another all the time, it's very tiring. So we need like a little break. Don't worry, I'll finish in a few minutes so that you can have a break. But so what we are trying to do is all these important elements we have to consider, but we have to have some kind of a glue-like hybrid spaces to put everything together. So all these elements are there, but it's not just putting on top of each other is a solution, but how to put together becomes very important, especially in a high-dense development. Everything has to go to vertical. You have to have a change of mood, change of space. If it's uh, mixed-use development, more so. So this is our philosophy. You know, with vision, we create building for people because we are actually building whatever that we are creating, whatever the function, in whatever the country. We have to respect all this context, but at the end, we have to have everybody who are using this building, this environmental building, has to feel good. So... I think everybody can have enjoyable drink after Patrick will question me to bits. And uh, I hope this uh, Q&A will be simple because everybody must be very thirsty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. We would now like to invite Mr. Patrick Phillips, Global CEO of Urban Land Institute, to moderate the Q&A session with Mr. Tange. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Um, you showed us some, some very beautiful buildings, very intriguing, very exciting buildings. And I think we all understand when we visit a place like Tokyo or many of the other cities that you showed us that part of the excitement that derives from those places comes from that, that verticality, that density. But, you know, it, I want to start by just recalling a com comment that uh, Sir John Major made yesterday. Now, it was in the context of uh, the Olympics and the legacy and so forth, but we found ourselves on the question of density and on, uh, on uh, tall buildings, particularly within older cities. And, uh, and uh, Sir John, I think, captured the ambivalence that many people feel when it comes to high density. Uh, that is that I think there's a, a recognition that density achieves the kind of uh, excitement and vitality that we seek, but that there are limits that when we think about uh, cities and communities and neighborhoods as collections of buildings, uh, there are clearly limitations to, to the deployment of, of high density across. So I just wanted to ask you, uh, you know, from your perspective, and maybe this relates to which kinds of sites are best for these kinds of buildings and which are less suitable, but how do you think of, of, of fitting these kinds of beautiful objects, these exciting individual buildings in, into, into cities so that they can form compelling neighborhoods, they can meet the street in an appropriate way, and they can support the notion of, of human-scaled communities? Well I, think it's, well, I think it's a very good, good question. And uh, I hope you didn't uh, think that you know, I'm just creating the uh, big uh, vertical buildings and be it. Actually, what we, we really do is it's, it's our tradition, actually. We always just, just to build one building, we create entire uh, block or even district. Because I think, uh, as I said earlier, I mean, all these elements 
tradition, culture, all these things, uh, we, are, we are studying that to fit in to the culture and tradition. Because um, you know, people from UK feel differently to people from Philippines uh, if you see a certain things. You know? So association is very important. So by looking at it, I mean, of course, I have shown you these buildings in a more like a high dense area already. And therefore, uh, these tall buildings will fit in somewhat OK. But I would not do this in a, a very small scale places. I mean, in, 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 in Japan, uh, there are certain areas that you simply do not look appropriate. So I think there is a limit. Or, I mean, you have to really understand the site. And then, of course, if you have a very small site, and then you cannot go single-handedly go vertical. It has to be uh, uh, within the uh, uh, area itself. So, I mean, if you want to create a tall building in the middle of nowhere, you really have to have a large piece of property. And then how that urban uh, uh, scale comes down and then meet the neighbors, I think is very important things. Now, we also think of, of streets as, as uh, civic space, as public space, space, yes. space where, where everyone can gather. Uh, in these kinds of, of uh, buildings and projects that you've shown us and that you've produced, uh, how, how, do you, um, how do you energize the space or, or convey a sense of broader ownership and access to the space? Um, uh, when perhaps, I would speculate here, but perhaps the developers of the buildings uh, want to contain it as private spaces. Are there, ways, are there ways that you've been able to introduce a more public or civic nature of those spaces? Well, I think it's uh, uh, depending on uh, locations and so on. I think you really have to understand the nature, what are the uh, people flow and movement and so on. And then that comes into very important role. And then also, I mean, people are quite different. Um, you know, I am maybe a very private person. You are a very outgoing person, and so on. So, I mean, these sizes of, you know, public spaces has to be, you have to give a choice. You know, if you're doing a large, large development, I mean, you're not making one big places uh, to, for people to gather. And then it's rather, you have to have a various uh, scale of the places. And then, you know, I think, a lot of times, that's the reason that I, I keep on going back to culture and tradition. I mean, a lot of times, we, we hope that we are uh, professional enough to have some sense that how people would use the space. But at the end of the day, that is our imagination. And so I think your intention is a certain way, but sometimes they use some other way. And then, but that's something that you know you really have to uh, give the space to people, and people find most comfortable way of that space. So I think it's, it, it, we hope architects and the urban planners are trained enough to have certain uh, ideas. You showed us uh, buildings in several different cities, and, and clearly your experience is, is uh, very broad throughout the region. Have you found that there are distinct cultural responses to these kinds of buildings, these kinds of large mixed-use projects? Yes, actually. Uh, for example, Singapore, I mean, people are uh, much more receptive of this kind of uh, mixed-use because, I mean, they, are, uh, they have seen this kind of large-scale development all the time. But as smaller cities, I mean, like Taipei, for example, um, they aren't, they're a rich city, Taipei, but uh, st still not so well developed for their sophistication. And so they do need time to accept different way of living. I mean, 20 years ago, when I went to tai, uh, Taipei, they told me, um, you know, they didn't have any shopping mall. And then this was their culture. Their culture was like a small street to go shopping. So when the first shopping mall came, and it was like a shock to them. You know, so I think, and then like, if you say, well, let's go to shopping mall, 
And then the shopping mall is not a shopping mall only, right? Because there's a plaza, there's activities, you can eat, you can enjoy. Just being there, there's activities. But some people say, oh, shopping mall, but I have nothing to buy. So I think there's a, a different city has a different mentality. And then I wouldn't say educate them, but I think we have to lead them to come up with their own solution to use that space in the best benefit for themselves. You know, I think we're all aware of the, uh, the impact of the elevator and uh, safe elevators and, and steel frame construction is driving in the first generation of skyscrapers. Are there emerging technologies or recent technologies that have allowed the kind of, um, of dynamic buildings that you've shown us? Elevator. Are, are, there, are there technologies that, that, that are emerging now with respect to building construction and design and engineering that are allowing this kind of, uh, of, of high density to, uh, to, to continue? Well, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, technology can do anything nowadays. <laughs> but, I mean, do we need that is another thing. I mean, as much as I talked about high density, tall building, vertical, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, in most of the Asian city, we do need this because lands are scarce. But sometimes you go to different part of the world and then these technologies are there, but necessity is not there. So I think that is the time that you start questioning, is that what you want to do? Um, if there is enough land, I don't think we should go vertical. I mean, I wouldn't, that's why I tried to create uh, this uh, hybrid spaces, at least to give, because we are people, right? We, we like to stay touching the earth and so on. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's, that's a nature. I mean, we, well, we are better than cavemen now, but, you know, basically we're the same. So I think what we, I'm trying to do is create a people-friendly spaces up in the higher level so that at least they can feel, oh, here's the earth. You know, so I think some cities, some countries, they just want to go high for the sake of going high. And uh, I'm sorry, there are many developers, but you know, some developers come up with big numbers. Then then you force us to fit into the land that I think it is not appropriate. And Sometimes I have to uh, say no, because if, if I create that kind of environment, it is not nice, it's not human. But then, you know, there are somebody else who's gonna do it. You're not suggesting that there's ego involved in high buildings, are you? Not at all, not at all. <laughs> no, but I mean, you have to understand that, you know, it's, it's, if there is no necessity, you know, uh, why, why do it? I mean, you don't want to, I mean, you arrive in the building and some tall buildings, I mean, to, to, you have a meeting, but you have to get there 20 minutes before because you have to get up there. So I think, is that, is that a, uh, if there's a Lancer not scarce, I mean, that's not the way that we should create the environment. Well, Paul, thanks you, uh, thank you again for sharing your experience with us and showing these, uh, these incredible buildings. Um, we need to close because I'm going to offer a few closing remarks before we let you go into the reception. But uh, again, please join me in thanking Paul Tongue. <laughs>